topic tonight is what is of interest to us, uh, the Iranian nuclear problem and what to do about it. And our guest uh, isn't new to the topic. I know she's written on it at least in 2001 and again in 2007 and, and maybe intermittently uh, as well. But it's a problem that she has devoted some attention to over a period of time. And what she will say about it is rooted in uh, interesting background educationally and in terms of her career in uh, matters of American foreign policy and, and national security in particular. Uh, she's an undergraduate of Stanford University and then has uh, two master's degree, one in government and one in public affairs from the University of Maryland, where she also uh, uh, has obtained her, her PhD. Uh, she's worked for the uh, in government. She worked on the Joint Chiefs of Staff for four years earlier in her career with some focus upon NATO and European questions. She uh, uh, was a special assistant to the Deputy uh, Secretary of Defense for Strategic Planning and Requirements and uh, a position which she later held, a similar position, the same title anyway, Strategic Planning and Requirements in the National Security Council. She then, uh, for a short period of time, was an advisor on foreign affairs to, to the Gugliani campaign. The shortness is explained. And, 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 uh, and then was uh, in a similar role for the uh, uh, McCain-Palin campaign. Unless you think that she's one-sided, I, I found out today that her sister is Michelle Obama's um, communications secretary now. So it's a it's a balanced family, <laughs> and she I'm over <laughs> yeah yeah and she uh, she told me that uh, they're independent thinkers that she had to work very hard to get her mother's vote for the McCain ticket. She had to be persuaded. But in any case, she's had a, uh, an interesting uh, background. She's now uh, at the Hoover Institution as a research fellow and an associate professor of international and security studies at the United States Military Academy at, at West Point. Uh, I was amused by that for several reasons, one of which I was told today, I, I was meeting her at the train station, that she would have uh, uh, shaggy brown hair and a black raincoat. And, uh, I spent four very long years taking courses at the academy, and we never had anyone with long, shaggy hair. <laughs> but, but that goes, they may today for all I know, but my, my time goes back more than a half a century, so it's a different, different world. But uh, in any case, uh, uh, but we did have some good faculty. Brent Scowcroft was an economics professor, for example. But then it was uh, at the academy. Um, entirely military officers, and it's changed uh, somewhat uh, in the intervening years. In any case, she's at the academy now. She's also taught at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. She's taught courses at the University of Maryland and the National Defense University. So she brings a very strong and long background uh, in the foreign affairs area. She has specialized on European affairs, German relations in particular, a lot of work on NATO, has done work in conflict resolution, nearly all of the areas of, uh, of uh, strategic matters with a special emphasis on strategic planning. One of the books she's written uh, or was involved in recently that really caught my attention was uh, the American role in an area of, uh, an era of predominance. And of course that forces one to look at the larger questions of, of global politics as well as the American role, and it is a controversial and interesting question. My only point is she brings a broad background in the area of national security, and it's my uh, absolute pleasure to present Dr. Corey Shakey. Um, so after all of that hoopla, I am embarrassed to start off by telling you folks that uh, the honest to God truth for all of us who are trying to do a little bit of work on what is going on in Iran is that none of us actually know very much. And my main message to you tonight is that anybody interested in managing the problem of a nuclear armed Iran or this Iranian government's progress towards 
uh, being a nuclear weapon state is that you need to have a hugely wide margin of error in your strategy because we are going to be wrong about a lot of crucial things. There's not that much we understand. The okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to repeat the main point, which is in dealing with Iran, we need to have a strategy that has an enormously wide margin of error, a tolerance for inaccuracy, because we are going to be wrong about a lot of important things. Um, this is a country with which we not, have not had diplomatic relations since 1979, um, an increasingly authoritarian country. And that's saying something, because the standard of authoritarianism they started with in 1979 was pretty high. Um, and one uh, in which the decision-making structure is um, not well institutionalized and opaque even where it is institutionalized. So my main message to you is that um, you shouldn't be impressed by anything Frank had to say uh, because very little of it uh, is actually going to be determinative in getting the answer to this problem right. What I'd like to do tonight um, is talk to you about four pieces of the Iran problem. First, what I believe is happening inside Iran. Second, uh, it, I'm, I'm not starting with the nuclear program because in many ways that is the easiest piece of this problem to understand. The context in which it is occurring I think is um, <laughs> more intellectually demanding and important in figuring out what you're going to do about the nuclear program. So I'm going to start with what's happening, what I believe is happening inside Iran. Second, uh, what does that mean for progress on the Iranian nuclear program? Third, what's the reaction in the region and in important American relationships about what Iran is doing? And fourth, what our policy is and maybe some other things we ought to be doing that we are not yet doing. So first, uh, what's happening inside Iran? For, there has been a, a real fracturing of the system of political control inside Iran for the last several years. The, it predates the June 2009 elections, but the 2009 elections exacerbated the kinds of tensions that I think are occurring. Uh, the structure, in theory, the structure of, of the Iran political system after the 1979 revolution is that you have a supreme leader at the, at the top of the decision-making structure, right? Uh, this is uh, Khomeini, was originally Khomeini, is now Khamenei. And he has uh, the authority to set both the tone and direction of what the government's been doing, but he's also the commander of the military forces. The president of Iran, and this is important to remember, I think, when Ahmadinejad starts grandstanding and saying reckless things, doesn't actually control either the military or the, the apparatus of state control uh, internal to the country. The supreme leader controls military forces, controls the intelligence community, controls the judiciary. Um, the president, uh, currently President Ahmadinejad, who was re-elected under dodgy circumstances to say the least in June of 2007, um, is principally responsible for running the economy. And I think that's hugely important as we, as we try and understand what's happening in Iran because Ahmadinejad's main responsibility is the place where the government of Iran is performing least well. And so a lot of what he is trying to do, in my judgment, on foreign policy and other things is distract attention from the fact that this is a country that ought to be exorbitantly wealthy and is not. Um, <clears throat> third element of the apparatus is the parliament, which a lot of people who, uh, who believe a better Iran is right around the corner um, argue that Iran has the most free and democratic elections of any country in the Middle East other than Israel. And at one level this is true. The parliamentary elections are feisty and, and thousands of people sign up to run. 
But there are two important things to remember that I think condition that much more narrowly than the advocates um, argue. The first is that um, more than a thousand people were stricken off of the lists to be able to run for parliament uh, by, by the Council of Guardians. I'll get to that in a minute. So more than a thousand people who wanted to run were prevented as dangers to the state from running. And second, 40% of the laws that the Parliament of Iran passes are struck down by the Guardian Council. So imagine the President vetoing 40%, of, well, maybe we can imagine in the next couple of years, <laughs> um, but, but that would be big news. That's not big news in Iran. And I think that's an important fingerprint of the political system about how little um, the Parliament actually matters. There's also the assembly of experts. These are publicly elected clerics um, <clears throat> from the body of whom is selected the supreme leader. And it's a little bit hard to, for me at least, to find the right comparison to what um, major clerics in Iran are like. There's a celebrity factor. They actually get the, the closest comparison I can come to, and it doesn't do justice, I think, to the seriousness of their scholarship, they're sort of like televangelists. They get supported by the people who watch their sermons, who come to them. There's a celebrity factor to this, but there is also, at another level, quite a serious, um, uh, uh, accreditation process. I mean, it, familiar to anyone who went it, to as many um, posh schools as I did, that, that it matters what your religious peers think of you. In fact, one of the biggest constraints on the power of the current supreme leader, um, <coughs> Khatami, excuse me, I'm bringing the last president back, um, Khamenei is that he's not respected by his religious peers. They haven't made him a senior, they haven't given him tenure among them. And part of the reason he went to Qom, you may have seen this in the newspapers in the last several days, spent 10 days in Qom um, <clears throat> and didn't come out with any more stature or any more credentialing than he had gone there with. And most people who watch Iranian, Iranian politics closely think that this is one more demonstration that the religious establishment, which is which the major religious universities and major theologians are in the city of Qom, um, that he couldn't deliver them to give him the kind of respect he was looking for is actually hugely politically significant. So that's the council, that's the assembly of experts. The council of guardians, 12 of them. Uh, thank you so much. So the council of guardians, um, half of them are appointed by the supreme leader, six of them appointed by parliament. Um, they get to veto parliamentary laws. They get to veto the work of the president, the executive as well. Um, the Expediency Council, which is run by uh, former Prime Minister Rafsanjani, they can overrule the Council of Government. And this is even before we bring in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, who are the military leadership, who protect the power of the state, and who are increasingly in control of the state-owned businesses or the religious establishment in Qom. So what you should conclude from this, it's complicated and fluid and dependent on the political skills and personalities of lots of people involved in the process. In June of 2009, there was a very important election in which President um, Ahmadinejad was seeking re-election. Uh, one of the central mysteries for those of us who watch Iran is why he and the Supreme Leader did what they did. Because he would probably have won the elections. He would not have carried Tehran, the, the capital of the country. 
but he had quite widespread support in the countryside and in the lesser cities. He probably could have carried the election. And yet, they put a great big heavy thumb on the scales and tried to claim that he had carried every demographic and every region of the country and that this was the biggest electoral landslide in the history of voting in Iran. And that was too much for uh, what, what we call the green movement, the, the people trying to bring the rule of law into power in Iran. And there were large scale street protests, uh, 20,000 people were jailed, uh, 20 people killed, mass trials, hundreds of people at a time, so not individual trials. Um, the uh, Ayatollahs in Qom, the religious establishment, refused to back President Ahmadinejad's claim. The supreme leader came in and claimed that he was elected by divine right and tried to throw the weight of, the, of his religious position behind him and, interestingly, failed. It didn't quell the protests. It didn't legitimate President Ahmadinejad. It more served to delegitimize the supreme leader. So much so, in fact, that the first vice president of revolutionary Iran, Mr. Bani Sadr, who came into power in 1979, complained that Iran is now run by a military financial mafia. Um, former President Khatami declared the election illegitimate. The opposition refused to intend the seating of the new president. Uh, the head of the intelligence community had to be dismissed because he was unwilling to get rough on the protesters. Um, there's a lot of, of difficulty with the disputed appointments. What I think this shows us is Supreme Leader Khatami's waning power and the regime's waning religious legitimacy. And this is really important because most Iranians don't like they don't want our, their teenage daughters to dress like our teenage daughters. And they don't want the kind of fractious kinetic politics we Americans thrive on. But what they do want is the rule of law and they do want their government to respect them. And this last week we saw for the first time the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, who are generally considered the crucial power base for Prime Minister Ahmadinejad, um, criticize him for suggesting that his job as president, the executive, was superior to that of parliament. Moreover, he, the IRGC also criticized the mullahs uh, in Qom for or excuse me, Ahmadinejad and by extension the Melissa Qom for a for turning away from pan-Islamist solidarity. That is what what I interpret that to mean, and it's one taxpayer's opinion, is that they are worried about the extent to which President Ahmadinejad is relying on nationalism and, and relying on them to keep him in power. What that tells me is that they feel the legitimacy of the regime eroding. And one thing to watch for next week, um, in the coming week, is that the Iranian government, because they are in dire financial straits, um, are trying to remove the subsidies that they provide for food and gasoline and things like that. Like the parallel of the Iranian economy is basically Venezuela. Like they ought to be rich, they're not. Um, and people are unhappy about the price fixing that goes on for political reasons. The government of Iran, Prime Minister Ahmadinejad, has had to bring the security forces out in mass in the major cities because they are afraid of public protests over the end of subsidies. Um, so the challenges to the regime are, are extremely significant. What does this mean for the Iranian nuclear program? The, my sad conclusion is nothing. It's not, all of this turmoil is not going to affect either the pace of what's happening in the Iranian nuclear program 
or uh, should a democratic regime come to power in Iran, I do not believe it will solve our problem. Uh, there is nothing to suggest that there is a wide divergence of views in the Iranian leadership on this issue. Uh, there, the, over the course of about the last 15 years, the program has proceeded apace. Even under President Khatami, who was the most open to the West, the most legitimate, the, the friendliest, most um, amenable Iranian government we can imagine, still proceeded apace. There are currently 7,000 centrifuges running. The Bushehir nuclear power plant, nuclear reactor, has just opened with the assistance of the Russians, by the way. The International Atomic Energy Agency is not permitted to inspect these. Uh, the head of the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence service, Meyer Dagan, who I take to be the definitive <laughs> source on this subject, um, thinks 2014 is when the Iranians cross the threshold. My judgment is that in an ideal world, what the Iranians want is what the Israelis have, which is the worst kept secret in the world. Um, they want to be a nuclear state without having to test, without getting caught red-handed doing anything, and the games they are playing are to draw out our timeline. The thing I am happiest about my tax money being spent on in the last several years, if in fact my tax money was spent on it, and I hope so, is this spiffy little uh, computer virus called Stuxnet, <laughs> which has interfered with the Iranian nuclear um, reactors and uh, and the centrifuges and has evidently slowed them down significantly. And it's a very elegant sort of warfare that is the future. Where's the guy I was talking to in the reception who actually works on this? Okay, during the Q&A, I want you to actually explain this at a level beyond what I have the ability to do. Um, this is cyber warfare in a way that is precise and elegant and wow do I hope my tax dollars paid for it. So what's going to happen when Iran crosses the nuclear threshold? Because in my judgment, our government has made a decision, and not just the Obama administration, but the Bush administration has made a decision that they are not going to prevent it by force. Um, I was, as Frank said, I was writing a little book about what a nuclear-armed Iran would mean for American interests back in 2000. And one of the most interesting things anybody told me in interviews was um, that if Israel was really concerned about the Iranian nuclear program, all the scientists would be dying in car accidents. <laughs> and I don't know whether any of you noticed that one of the major Iranian nuclear scientists died in a traffic accident last summer. Um, we may be back in the age of effective espionage, and for this problem, I very much hope so. So what's the reaction to this? Well, one of the interesting and positive reactions is that the Gulf Cooperation Council states, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the UAE, the countries that are basically our allies um, in the neighborhood are really worried. Worried enough that they are actually cooperating with each other and overtly cooperating with us, both of which are difficult things to achieve. Basically, um, the ideal outcome for most of the GCC states is for them to do nothing, us to risk everything, and take all the blame for what happens. Um, but they're actually doing a fair amount that's constructive now. In this new round of sanctions, the, um, the government of Bahrain, who is Iran's commercial banker, has for the first time started to turn the screws uh, and close down Iranian letters of credit. So there's significant progress with the GCC. Turkey is, I think, the most problematic um, relationship in the neighborhood. The Turks, as you know, American allies um, for, since what, 1956, would not vote with us on the UN Security Council uh, resolution that, that imposed this latest round of sanctions. And it is a non-trivial detriment 
that the Obama administration couldn't get a unanimous sanctions agreement. The three previous rounds had been unanimous. Turkey and Brazil refused to vote it against. They didn't just abstain this last time. And that's problematic because that makes it easier for countries like China and Russia who will go along with it but want to cheat on them um, to get around it. <coughs> What I think we are seeing as a result of the progress of the Iranian nuclear program is a tighter hold on the United States relationship by the GCC countries, the countries that lack confidence they can handle Iran or want to without us being in the center of the, the picture, um, and a lot of hedging of bets by other countries in the region to include Turkey. Um, I'll get to that when I come to sanctions in just a minute. Lebanon is is fragile now and growing more fragile um, as a result of this. Uh, the Chinese just signed a $40 billion oil and gas refining deal. The Russians have called the sanctions counterproductive. In fact, the only way we got the Russians and Chinese to agree to this round of sanctions was to tacitly suggest that their companies would not be subject to them. So the only way you even get two, v two votes against is to say that two of the most important technical and economic collaborators will not be subject to the sanctions. Um, the European Union, likewise, allows oil and gas in and out of Iran. And I don't know whether any of you saw the last week or so, the German foreign minister suggested that despite the sanctions ramp up, that this wouldn't uh, be diminished because, I'm quoting, we don't want sanctions to have any negative effect. <laughs> <laughs> the government of Turkey, Prime Minister Erdogan, has, uh, on a recent trip to Iran, uh, uh, set the goal of tripling trade between their countries. Um, and so, this is problematic. That said, the person in your government you should be happiest whose salary you pay um, is a guy in the Treasury Department who has made these sanctions go so far beyond what has been titularly agreed to. Sixteen banks have been sanctioned, eight individuals. Um, as Stewart's just back from a trip to Turkey where he was trying to turn them on it. September 30th, he pulled off an elegant little piece of work by getting the major oil companies to agree to stop importing and exporting out of Iran. And what he did was use American domestic law to extraordinarily good purpose by um, telling them that they would not be subject to to sanctioning by the American government as long as they did this. So we are unilaterally turning off access to American financial markets and using the penalties associated with being closed out of the American market, where most major companies are listed on the stock exchanges and do an enormous amount of business and want to do their trade in dollars. So. The problem with our policy is not that the sanctions undertaken at the UN and um, on a voluntary basis beyond that aren't useful. They are. But we only have two planks to a policy, right? We have sanctions and we have the offer of negotiations on the nuclear program. But given where the Iranians are, they're not actually very interested in negotiating on the nuclear program. Moreover, as Secretary Clinton said uh, uh, in this last round of discussion about setting a timeline for negotiations, it's not at all clear anyone in Iran could make a deal the government could deliver on. So we have two lines of activity that aren't going to add up to achieving our objectives. Lots of things you could do, most of them bad choices. I want to suggest a couple of small things. I'm a, a desperate St. Louis Cardinals baseball fan. And so I'm a big believer in the fundamentals, right? And good small ball that doesn't rely too heavily on, on sluggers to deliver stuff. That's what we learned from the Mark McGuire era. Um, so first, 
as I said at the start, we need a strategy with a very wide margin of error because we're going to be wrong about a lot of the things that we think are occurring. Second, we are talking very narrowly to the Iranian government only about their nuclear program. And that not only is a place we are least likely to make any progress with them, but it is also what plays to their strength domestically. And instead of doing that, I would argue that what we ought to be talking to the Iranians about is sort of like the old uh, CSCE conversations with the Soviets in the 1970s, where you have a basket on human rights, you have a basket on economics, you have a basket on security. We need to open the aperture up and play to our actual strengths in this conversation, to talk past the Iranian government and force the Iranian government into a conversation with its own people on the very things we think would change Iran in positive ways. So broaden the dialogue beyond nuclear weapons so that we are talking about things that will turn up the temperature on the Iranian government with its own people. I should say that I don't believe a democratically elect elected Iranian government is going to solve the nuclear problem or a whole bunch of our other problems. But it is still a better situation than we are in now, and I think a more manageable situation over time. That is, I think a nuclear-armed Iranian government of a different constitution than this one would be um, more amenable to our influence and our working cooperatively with in the future. Third, um, we have done a pretty good job across the last several administrations of uh, of leading our relationship with the Chinese with a positive vision, right? Think of Bob Zelik talking about um, the Chinese as responsible stakeholders in the international order. We haven't done anywhere near that with Iran, and Iranians and the Iranian government are thirsting for stature and respectability. And we are only working the, the sticks, not the carrots as creatively as we could be. I, I'm in favor of the negotiations the Obama administration wants to have, but there's a lot of other stuff we can do it, be doing. My favorite example as somebody who comes from California, which is earthquake country, um, Iran is also earthquake country. We know a lot about building codes and safety and how firefighters handle crises like that. Instead of having high-level government-to-government negotiations, which strengthens Ahmadinejad and the very people we don't like. Opening up to small scale little stuff, city zoning laws and firefighters and how they handle earthquakes, that kind of stuff will serve us um, in a lot of ways. First of all, it opens a broader, um, a broader circle of people that we have access to, which is one of the main detriments of our of our knowledge to Iran now. Second, it will uh, build confidence that we're not, you know, trying to drive Iran in the ground. We don't like this Iranian government, but we're quite pro-Iranian. Anybody know what the s second largest Iranian city in the world is? Los Angeles, you're exactly right. Um, I'm sorry? <laughs> we can be even more specific, yes, UCLA's neighborhood. Um, so a lot of these kinds of things, and the last thing I would say that I think we should do, and, and I realize this is ancien regime, um, is that to keep the military option on the table, because I think there are two points in time in which the Iranians were actually willing to be constructive in negotiations about their nuclear program. One of those was 2003, right after we invaded Iraq. And they were worried that they were next. And so I think it is useful to keep the pressure on this regime in that way, even though I grant that one of the few things we could do to make Iranians rally around this government would be to actually do that, actually strike their nuclear plans. But I think keeping it on the table is actually quite useful. Um, and second, to operationally box in the IRGC. Uh, Admiral Mullen and the folks in the Pentagon have done this quite ably by, by just moving a little closer to the coast and a few more patrols in the Straits of Hormuz and things that remind them 
that actually, if they want to fight, that's our long suit. So on that note, I'll be glad to take questions. <laughs> I failed to warn you that uh, our, of our method, our usual method here. I'll recognize people and repeat the question for the camera since it Alrighty. needs to be repeated. Question is what makes you think that Hominy would allow low level initiatives? It's a terrific question. Um, I actually think he might for two reasons. First, it doesn't give the, you know, Iranian, average Iranians are quite pro American. Like, it's, it's the country in the Middle East that has the strongest pro-American public attitudes, and that could be just because they've had so little access to us over the years. <laughs> but, but I do think Los Angeles as the second largest city, and so many Iranians prospering here in the United States is actually a big part of that. And so allowing that kind of connection would take, it would turn down some of the resistance to the government, I think. I think it would be a net gain for the government domestically to have done it. And second, unlike the high-level political negotiations, which President Ahmadinejad or the Supreme Leader would have to be seen as delivering, this is low-level enough that it doesn't benefit, it's not a kingmaker for any of the high-level participants in the power games in Iran. So I think they're actually more likely to permit that than to permit useful negotiations at a high level. And the third thing is, if they don't allow it, that actually, they then actually have to explain that to their own people, and that's the political space we want this government having to operate in. So even if they don't agree to it, I actually think it's a net gain. Yeah, yeah two questions. One. Uh, uh, why not uh, remove the, the, sh the, uh, the, the uh, current leaders via the same method through which uh, the Shah was removed? Mm -hmm. And secondly, who in the world uh, favors a Iranian uh, nuclear power? On the first question, there's a terrific piece, I think it's in the national interest, by Kenneth Pollack, who runs the Saban Center at Brookings, who is, for my money, one of the best Iran watchers out there. Um, and it's out in just in the last week or so. And one of the arguments that Ken makes is that uh, Khamenei, he's only the second supreme leader and, and spent a lot of time studying how it is they took over from the Shah. And Ken's conclusion is they're not gonna fall by the same means. They're gonna fall by different means. Um, so uh, he, the short answer is they're working very hard to prevent exactly that constellation from coming. Second, though, is that um, for my, one of the things that, one of the difficulties we face in trying to get other countries to help support us on the sanctions is that most other countries believe that what comes after this regime in Iran is likely to be messier and worse than what we're looking at now. Um, it, it's partly the legacy of the bungling of the Iraq War. It's partly the legacy of distrust of regime change. But it's also that most of our allies in the world um, are status quo powers or they don't want fast, rapid change. I mean, look at the way the South Koreans think about North Korea. They want it to happen over a generation. They don't want it to happen tomorrow. And I think that's sort of the attitude of most countries on sanctions. There, they, um, it was said by the British historian Arnold Toynbee that the United States is like a very large, very friendly dog in a small, crowded room. That we start <laughs> wagging our tail and we knock all the furniture over. And that is what we look like, even to some of our closest friends in the world. And they. They're very hesitant about our enthusiasms on this kind of stuff. And so they want to take it a lot slower than, I think, we with our kind of rambunctious Jacksonian sense of frontier freedom, who, hey, free people deserve to be free and we ought to help them. That's not the attitude of most countries. The other thing I would say on sanctions is that um, uh, countries like China, um, Right, they'll let us twist their arm to go along with sanctions if they were going to be the only ones having to vote against it. 
or if we have put them sufficiently in the limelight in the run up to the Olympics or the G20 or something where they want to look um, presentable. Unless we have those kinds of circumstances, they basically want to take all the advantage they can of the space that, of not having to be competitive with American and European companies. And I think that's the gas deal you see the Chinese signing. Should Israel attempt to take out the nuclear potential with force, uh, what is the most likely American reaction? It's a terrific question, Arthur, and I think the, the honest answer, as with all good questions, is it depends. It depends on the circumstances. If Iran taking out the, if Israel taking out the Iranian nuclear program looks like a computer virus that, that all of us only recognize when smart guys have reverse engineered it, that's easy, right? What's anybody going to do about that? If you have a short, precise strike that, uh, that is a warning signal to the Iranians that we understand where their uh, undeclared facilities are and we have the ability to take a couple of them out and every time they build one, we're gonna knock one out or the Israelis are gonna knock one out. Um, not clear to me what the reaction is to that. I will tell you though that um, I had an experience uh, in a Gulf country about a year ago that I think several other people have had as well, which is to have someone in a position of responsibility from the, one of those countries suggest that if it happened fast, they could turn the radars off and pretend they didn't see it. <laughs> but if this is gonna be several weeks, um, and if you were really gonna try and eradicate the Iranian program, what that actually means, I mean, these guys learned the lessons of the attack um, against the Iranian, against the Iraqi nuclear facilities. They have buried them deeply. They've co-located them in, in culturally valuable and religiously significant sites, right? One of the major development facilities is in Qom. <laughs> this will be hard to do, and it'll be an ex you're going to have to attack what you know, see what moves, see what they move to protect, and then you're going to have to attack again and again if, you, if eradicating the program is your goal. And if sending a signal is your goal, you could do different. I, I, there are so many variables in this. Um, for me, the major one is speed, and that depends on your objectives. It's very hard to say, but, but none of the outcomes have American popularity in the Middle East increasing. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> Would you comment on the possibility or the wisdom of recognizing Iran? Yeah, it's a good question and I think an important one. I personally um, think that it is more helpful to be talking to our enemies than not talking to our enemies, so I'm quite sympathetic to your point of view on it. Um, I, I am sure the Iranians you know are very nice people, but the president of the country is not a nice person. And, and rounding up 20,000 people because they think the election was stolen is not a nice act. And, um, and threatening to wipe Israel off the map is not a conducive thing to positive relations. Like there's a lot of bad stuff the Iranians are doing. The funding of Hezbollah and Hamas that have kept the Palestinian territories and Lebanon fragile and politically intractable are not good things. So, you know, it's a complicated, it's a complicated process, but I basically agree with you that we should be talking to the Iranians and the more we talk to them, the more likely we are to win the argument. Because after all, how is it that a country that has Hollywood, Madison Avenue, a permanent 24-hour news and political cycle can't win these arguments? That's what we do domestically. We just need to do a little more of it internationally. If Bahrain continues to tighten the financial screws, who will they turn to next? I'm so glad you asked that. I think it, it's the, quite literally, 
billion dollar question. <laughs> the Iranian government and the IRGC have been trying to open front banks in Malaysia and Indonesia recently. And they've been trying to work small scale letters of credit. And the boys in the Treasury Department are doing fantastic work. Like it's really impressive how much these guys can actually follow the money and you know, show up on a bank's doorstep and say, if you expect to hold dollars, trade in dollars, list on the US stock markets, um, you would better not take this business. And banks are responsive to that. I wonder, uh, just a footnote to this, of the degree of difficulty for the Iranian government of, of being able to uh, work in the dollar-denominated international financial order is that many of you may have seen recently that, <laughs> um, that the, gov the chief of staff to President Karzai in Afghanistan has been accepting garbage bags full of currency from the Iranians. Yeah, it wasn't dollars, it was euros because they couldn't get dollars. <laughs> Sanctions are actually having a useful effect and the smart guys in the treasury are superb at this. Like, I spend a lot of time in these earnest, good government working groups about how to make whole of government operations possible and all that kind of stuff. The only part of the American government as good at its job as the American military is, is this one little shop in the Treasury Department who can track the money and the sanctions. How do the Sunni countries see Iran as a threat? Yeah. Um, the, all of Iran's neighbors, Sunni and Shia, um, and non-Arabic, uh, non-Muslim I should say, uh, view the Iranians as an enormous threat and have for a long time. That's a different question. So, so I've made your hard question easy by, by saying that. So let me try and engage the hard part of it, which is why aren't they more helpful? Um, and uh, the, the answer is that Iran very effectively challenges the religious legitimacy of those governments. If you look, for example, at the Saudis, right? The Saudis bought into a quite extreme view in the Muslim world of the interpretation of their faith. And they, the ruling family bought legitimacy with a compact with the most conservative mullahs in their society. This is in the 70s and 80s. And, and by the way, those of you who haven't read Rachel Bronson's terrific book, Thicker Than Oil, which is a history of US-Saudi relations, um, it's the best read on the subject. And she documents quite clearly how much we encouragedly encouraged this because religious governments were a bulwark against godless communism. Um, so we're a party to this. Uh, at the, there were attacks on the religious sites in Saudi Arabia, um, Medina and places, uh, maybe 15 years ago, that the Iranians were behind. And the, it scared the hell out of the Saudi government because the Iranians have long suggested, this revolutionary Iranian government has long suggested the Saudi government doesn't have the religious legitimacy to be in physical control of the, the faith's major sites. So part of the reason, I mean, part of it is just shameless commercialism. And part of it is they don't feel strong enough to be able to do anything useful Part of it is that they don't actually trust us enough to go in whole hog with us because they're going to live next door to the Iranians for a really long time and we're not a terrific ally in all sorts of ways. But it is also this question of legitimacy and the Iranians have played that very effectively. One of the very important developments coming out of the changes that we have seen in Iraq in the last, um, uh, since the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, is the burgeoning authority of Ayatollah Sistani, who is Iranian born, he's the major uh, Islamic cleric in Iraq, uh, and they, he has redefined for many Muslims 
the intersection of political and religious space by not trying the Veliati dominance that the Iranian clerics, that the Iranian revolution brought for their clerics, but instead in a way that would be actually easily recognizable to a cheerful Episcopalian pastor um, in my hometown, defining political space by norm um, and by faith rather than by control. So I think that's changing in a really interesting and important way. And part of why the reaction of the mullahs in Qom declaring the election illegitimate and refusing Khamenei the support of the religious establishment to validate the election matters so much. Iran's losing its legitimacy to challenge the legitimacy of others. Two questions. One, would you comment on conventional weapons held by Iran? And secondly, does the dynamic of the current situation make the possibility of uh, neighboring countries feeling more favorably toward Israel? This is great. I feel like I have a translator in my own language. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so um, overlooking the conventional, um, I, I don't actually think um, that either this administration or its predecessors has overlooked the threat of Iran's conventional weapons. This is why, this is part of the reason that recognizing the, this government of Iran is so difficult because they are in the chain of proliferation, the China, North Korea, Pakistan, um, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, Hamas, chain of proliferation that has put these conventional weapons in the arms of people sitting very close to Israel's borders, and as we saw in the 2006 war, um, very willing to use them and very willing to use them against civilian population centers. So there, a lot of effort goes into trying to identify, track, prevent Iranian shipments of conventional weapons. And, and I think actually the record's not half bad. We do reasonably well at that. Um, I, I would prefer we had to rely less on Israeli intelligence to tell us what we should do. We ought to be good at this by now. Um, but, but I think we're reasonably good at it. And the second, why aren't states in the region more pro-Israel? What the states in the region would tell you is that if only the Israelis would be constructive on Palestinian issues, if only the Middle East peace process were working better, that these governments could publicly recognize Israel and support us. I myself am skeptical of that proposition. I think it's an excuse for what they would do anyway. But that is what they say. Um, that, and again, it goes to, I don't mean to be, to be corny, but, but I actually think a lot about issues of political culture. And the reason that democracy is, is the best, and I mean that in sense of moral goodness, form of government is that you gotta win the argument and you've gotta win it all the time in governments that don't have to win the argument with their populations, either by, by family control, tribal control, um, stolen elections, whatever the means is. If you don't have to win the argument, a lot of this kind of stuff becomes self-fulfilling. And that's where I think they are. Since, uh, <laughs> since you don't hold a government position, <laughs> Uh, would, you, would you comment upon how well Hillary Clinton is doing uh, mm -hmm. with respect to our policy toward Iran? And secondly, is her stature going to be such that she could lead the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in 2012? I don't hold a government position, but I do hold a sister dear who works in the administration. <laughs> no, no. So I'm a little bit constrained on the latter one. I'll give you my analytic view, though, as a political gunslinger. Uh, the first is that... Um, I think Secretary Clinton's actually doing a terrific job. I think she talks tough, like she aligned herself very early with Secretary Gates on the substantive policy issues. I frankly think the Afghan review, both the one that occurred in March and more importantly the one uh, that reported out last fall that the President gave his speech at West Point. Uh, laying out the policy on, I think both of those would have come out differently 
and less beneficial to American interests if Secretary Clinton weren't Secretary of State. I think she, she thought her way through the problem. She aligned herself um, with Secretary Gates because she believed he was substantively right. Um, and the two of them together carried the policy in a way I don't think Secretary Gates could have himself. Um, I think she's been terrific in Asia. You know, the tough talk that she is giving about freedom of the seas and our willingness to negotiate or to help adjudicate difficulties between the Chinese and the Japanese while making clear that um, the people we like best are the people we are allied to defend. <laughs> I think she's hit the balance very nicely. And that's, um, I'm not a, you know, I didn't vote for her, obviously. Um, uh, but I think she's done a very good job. To your second question, which I've been giving a little bit of thought to since it's a political season, um, I think the president is much more vulnerable to a challenge from the left than he is to a challenge from the establishment right in the Democratic Party for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that the, the way that the elections this week redrew the, the electoral map of the country is that there are f fewer moderate Democrats serving in Congress because uh, Democratic fortunes had ebbed out into what are largely conservative districts and those got taken back. And I think um, both as a, as a judgment on, on how people thought the president was doing his job, but also on how people thought the Democratic leadership in Congress was doing their job. So <clears throat> I think there, there will be less of a pool of, of more conservative Democrats to challenge the president, because I think those folks and the independents who trend conservative have actually moved into Republican ranks um, for at least one electoral cycle. Uh, where I think the president is more vulnerable is to a challenge on the left, because as I read the, the sort of the commentary of, of political people on the left, they don't believe the president and Congress um, got shellacked because they were uh, too liberal. They believe it was because the president didn't go far enough. And so I think that opens on the left. Um, I don't think the president will get a primary challenge because that's the equivalent of committing suicide for the Democrats. Like even if he wins the challenge, he'll lose the election, the presidential election. Traditionally, that's what happens when you get a primary challenger. Um, so I think it unlikely he will get one, but if he gets one, I'd bet my money it'll come from the left, not the right of the Democratic Party. Uh, it's been an absolutely marvelous evening for which we're deeply in your debt. Thank you. Thank you folks for coming out to talk with me.